About seven years ago, I participated in an experiment, an experiment that would be the beginning of the rest of my life. Deep in the recesses of my mind lies the moment where I took the first sip of a large bottle of vanilla extract, containing 90% alcohol, hidden cleverly at the very back of a cupboard that was meant exclusively for miscellaneous food holders and foodstuffs that weren't meant to be used. Long forgotten were these items, meant to be forgotten at the very least, but there, in that drawer of lost dreams, lied what would become the subsequent subject of my dreams. For at least five out of the seven nights of each week of my newly teenage and then newly adult life, therein lied the alcohol, probably placed there with the intention of being hidden from my drunk and drugged up stepbrother who was kicked out years ago, and continued to be placed there out of simple habit. I knew where it was. After having grabbed the vanilla ice cream from the freezer, the mere thought of the taste of which caused salivation in my 14-year-old mouth, it was ready to be doused in the alcohol, including extract I found in the cupboard I scoped out four years prior. The opportunity existed right below in the fridge, in the form of my mother's tequila, but I refused, probably because of the memories of recent beatings it aroused in me during one of her many drunken stupors, or maybe because I was too scared of the branding. Branding is scary, after all. It's dangerous. Without knowing how much was an adequate amount, any amount sufficed, and the amount I consumed far exceeded that which would have been tolerable without any tolerance. My motor skills rapidly decreased to the extent that they existed in an autistic male without spatial awareness, as did each and every one of my cares for the world. I was gone. I was no longer there. It was exactly that feeling that caught me, enticed me, became the subject of my dreams. Throughout my life up to now, and indeed up to that point as well, I had been plagued by the hyper-fantasiatic recall of each and every one of my social pitfalls, not the least of which I had been scolded, berated, and beaten for. Even the slightest variation in my speech, demeanor, disposition, or expression was met with scorn, treated as an aberration that must be liquidated, and while I, the autistic male, could not liquidate the arbitrary traits deemed as aberrations in this wrong planet I was born in, that would not stop the planet from treating me as a monster that must be called. I wondered desperately what was wrong with me, what I could possibly change. And from the perspective of someone who did not want to harm others nonetheless, my abusers, the abuse I incurred, was interpreted from the perspectives from the perspective that it must have been deserved. Otherwise, why would it occur? Surely I would not do such a thing to anyone else without a valid reason. Surely these people were operating under the same assumptions as me. I was wrong on multiple levels and suffered as a result. In a small town where you are forced to see the same people every day, every small thing goes remembered. And for that reason, every small thing is significant. Especially when abusive people, that is, people markedly different from the norm in a negative sense, make every small thing even more significant. This is why I developed social anxiety. This is why I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. The hyperphantasia I had, likely tied to being on the autism spectrum, only made my recall of whatever minuscule event I found traumatic all the more vivid. It added insult to injury, when I was covered in injuries. Shortly after turning 16, I tried something that wasn't alcohol or nicotine or amphetamine or Ritalin. 
the only drugs I had tried up to that point, and the drugs I had the most exposure to by far. I tried antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics under the supervision of a doctor. It wasn't just one of each either. It was dozens of different ones, and dozens of different combinations. A revolving door of medications defined my life at this point. At best, they did nothing, and at worst, they made everything far worse than they already were. I stopped taking psychiatric medication. I started smoking marijuana. I started drinking again. For a moment, I didn't have to bother with knowing who I am for a while at least. Needless to say, I have stopped Needless to say, I have not stopped remembering in vivid detail all of the mishaps I've made and been punished for, nor have I forgotten the beatings, the sexual abuse, or characterizations from my family that were designed seemingly to decimate my self-esteem, and no amount of therapy, however much I've tried, has mitigated this problem. If anything, it's worsened. I shout slurs now when I remember how I've been hurt. Racial slurs. This fact terrifies me. I can't leave my house without being terrified of myself. The only moments of solace I seem to have are the moments I drink, or as I would come to learn in the later half of my teenage years, the moments I'd take recreational drugs. In one of my previous articles, The Story of My Enslavement, I talked about emotions as though they're a prison. I talked about my emotional outbursts alienating me from others and how the momentary relief drugs provided would prevent me from going off on people I cared about. What I didn't quite talk about was how those outbursts are intimately related to how I recall events from my past, how I relate them to my current environment. If even the smallest thing reminds me of the past, no matter how far removed it is, tragedy begins to strike, and I may strike violently as a preemptive response to what I view as that tragedy reoccurring. My view being admittedly skewed and as such wrong. What I didn't talk about in that video directly, but rather implicitly suggested, was I am enslaved by psychoactive substances, a prison I have built for myself when put under duress by, out by my outlying environment, hell-bent on traumatizing me no matter how far I get from it. What I didn't talk about directly, but rather implicitly, was the notion of freedom and choice themselves, and how it relates to a person clearly mind-fucked by circumstance. I am mind-fucked by circumstance, with no clear way out and no traditional route in sight. The only thing that has worked, and not consistently, mind you, has been what everyone recommends against due to its tendency to... well, I'll explain in a moment. Everyone knows you are recommended against drugs. Most people know why. And this is felt across the ideological spectrum, even in people who have scanned the breadth of research surrounding, say, heroin clinics in Switzerland that functionally treat heroin as an antidepressant in its participants, the drug that's stigmatized against the most. Those liberal proponents of this system tend to intuitively possess some of this same stigma still. The argument goes as follows. Relying on a drug prevents the drug user from directly addressing their problems, as they consistently seek the drug for refuge from their problems. This causes a cyclical and compounding effect, wherein the drug user has exacerbated their existing problems by way of ignoring them. Imagine a pile of trash consistently building up, until it overflows and rules everything around you. That's the common conception of addiction. I'll be the first to say, I am an alcoholic, and I am a drug addict. 
that's apparent to anyone who's read my articles about drugs or alcohol, but nowhere in my life has this narrative applied. At the same time that I've used drugs to escape from my problems, I've addressed them. I've been forced to, because it's physically and financially impossible for me to respond to every single piece of negative stimuli with getting wasted. There will be moments I must face reality, the same reality that I've been facing for as long as I can remember, the same reality that hasn't gotten much better during my time on this rock. The one that's changed is my consciousness, something that has, in the short term, felt like it's in my control. And with my short excursions, excursions into escapism at my back, I've re-entered this world with a renewed sense of optimism, a reminder that positive feelings are possible. And with that, a better outlook to directly face my trauma and, mind st and the mind state that stems from it. This is my experience. Is it any surprise, then, that I find myself drunk as I write this? That to me there's nothing if there's no wine? I relapsed. Because the day I was born, my future, they chose to forfeit. December 15th, 2020, I quit. Today... I submit, and I accept that that it's something I can put up with.